Australia is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Its GDP per capita stands at $65,400 and ranks 14th worldwide. At the same time, it's also one of the most isolated countries in the world. And it is this distance that gives the impression that Australia is security-wise invulnerable and irrelevant to the global geopolitical arena. Yet, for most of its history, Australia has participated in numerous military confrontations. Its soldiers have fought in Europe, Africa and Asia. With the exception of World War II, none of these conflicts posed any genuine threat to the security of Australia. This begs the question, why has a wealthy and secure nation as Australia fought in so many wars? What has driven its leaders to send their bravest and brightest to faraway front lines? What has shaped the mindset of the Australian geopolitics? In this report, we will explore this question as well as the history of Australia. And we can start by stating that the traditional perception of Australia as a secure and isolated country is plain out wrong. Welcome to Caspian Report, my name is Shirvan. For more information on the channel, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash Caspian Report. The two biggest factors in geopolitical studies is the human condition and geography. These two factors seem pretty straightforward, but when combined, they form the national policy of a nation. The human condition means that when leaders are confronted with issues, despite the differences in culture, they will appear to be more alike in their thinking. The geographic condition means that the place where a community is located defines the needs and fears of that community. Over time, this forms the mindset of a nation. In other words, the policy of any state is shaped by its centuries-long communal experience in that specific geographic place. Historically, the territory of Australia was well known to the Muslim and Chinese empires. Yet, the northern and western coasts proved unattractive to these empires. Plus, the territory was too far away and there were far richer and easier locations in the Indonesian territories. As a result, no one but the aboriginals maintained a human presence in Australia. When the British Empire began colonizing Australia in 1788, the only real challenge was the conquest and subjugation of the native population. Over the century, the aboriginals were crushed and driven off their lands. This campaign became known as the Australian Frontier Wars. It is during the frontier wars that the state of Australia started to take shape as an outpost of the British Empire. However, unlike other colonies, Australia was an island. The needs of the local communities differed greatly from other regions. Like most island nations, Australia had to import goods that were not available in the continent, and in exchange, primary commodities such as iron ore and wool were exported to distant locations. The import and export of commodities mostly went to customers within the global trade network of the British Empire. This leads to Australia's strategic problem. Given its location, the country's trade must go by sea. Yet, Australia was not in a position to guarantee the security of its maritime trade. The need to trade by sea and the lack of naval security transformed Australia into a dependency of the leading global maritime power, which at the time happened to be the British Empire. For London, Australia was an ideal colony. Unlike the American experience, Australia was trading with the United Kingdom and fully dependent on the maritime trade, which too was controlled by the British. For Australia, this dependency on trade meant that if the maritime trade routes to London or other British colonies were ever threatened, then so too was the prosperity of Australia jeopardized. So, in order to safeguard its prosperity, engaging in the British trade network was not enough. Australia had to fight for the British Empire, and so the foundation of Australian geopolitics was decided by its dependency on maritime trade. In 1901, Australia, after a decade of planning and voting, achieved its independence from the British Empire. However, for all practical purposes, Australia still depended on the British for their trade securities. Thus, the old colonial geopolitical status still applied. This explains why, even after independence, 
Australia still acted as a dependency or a vassal of the British Empire. So Australia as an independent state formalized its geopolitics along two fundamental national interests. For one, if the British Navy ruled the seas, it meant that Canberra was not in a state to give the British Empire any excuse to intervene with its access to the trading routes. Meaning, the newly independent Australian state had no choice but to align itself with the interests of the British Empire. Second, aligning with London was a step in the right direction, but it was not enough. Australia's maritime trade bypassed many choke points and straits. Most of these strategic points were far beyond Canberra's influence, yet Australia's trade depended on these choke points. The only way to secure its maritime trade was to convince the leading maritime power to actively protect the interests of Australia. This is of course easier said than done. Most people will believe there exists sentimental value to alliances. This simply is not true. Nations do not have permanent friends or allies. They only have permanent interests. When creating an alliance, there are always certain factors to consider. Most of the time, a country will ally itself with the country that poses the greatest threat. In Australia's case, this happened to be the British Empire. Canberra had to find some way to make the leading naval power dependent on Australia. In essence, Australia had to offer or withdraw something that could shape the behavior of the British Empire. Usually this meant Australia's participation in British wars. It's worth mentioning that a global power as the British Empire was always engaged in some conflict or dispute and was always in search of additional support and resources. Australia offered to ease the security burdens of the British Empire in exchange for guarantees and protection. Think of it as a take and give relationship. This rather unique geopolitical strategy is referred to as the Vessel or Marshall strategy. And as explained earlier, it is rather a cold calculated security arrangement with little to do with cultural affinity or historic sentiment. The cost of maintaining an alliance with the leading naval power was high. Australia had to participate alongside the British during the Second Boer War and the First and Second World Wars. Australian troops were deployed in every corner of these conflicts, from Russia to Turkey to Sudan and Egypt. For the same reasons, Australia participated in the wars in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan. Even though most of these conflicts had little to do with the direct interests of Australia, this was the cost of maintaining an alliance with the global naval power. For a while, the vessel strategy seemed to be working. The British Empire became dependent on Australia's military commitments. Then the Second World War broke out. Most of Europe was overrun by Nazi Germany, but the fight still continued in the European colonies. Australia had deployed its troops in North Africa, where they were fighting to control the Suez Canal and Gibraltar, two crucial choke points in the supply lines of the global British trade empire. Australia was so dedicated in defending these strategic points that the homeland itself was left mostly undefended. Canberra trusted the British Royal Navy to defend the maritime trading routes that were vital to Australia. Then something unexpected happened. The British garrison in Singapore surrendered to the Japanese forces. Suddenly, Australia for the first time in history faced a genuine threat. Withdrawing their armies from North Africa was logistically not possible and would have resulted in the Allied loss of the Suez Canal. At the same time, the Japanese military was closing in on Australia. It is during these desperate times that the Australian leadership opted to no longer wait and rely on the British Navy, but rather on the American Navy. The United States intervened in the Coral Sea and pushed back the Japanese Navy which led to Japan's failure to capture New Guinea. Following the Battle of the Coral Sea, Japan realized that the invasion of North Australia would be pointless and abandoned its plans. In the meantime, American forces had landed in Australia 
and the US High Command took control of the Australian forces. Before the Australian leadership even realized it, their country became a dependency of the United States. After World War II, the American Navy dominated the world's maritime traffic. Australia's two primary national interests dictated that the country had to apply its vessel strategy with the United States. In essence, this meant that Australia had to deploy its troops in American wars in order to secure guarantees from the United States on Australia's maritime traffic. From Canberra's point of view, the wars in Korea, Vietnam, Iraq and Afghanistan had little to do with ideology or cultural affinity towards the United States. Rather, it was a cold calculated security arrangement based on the leading maritime power. First it was the British Empire and then it was the United States. To sum things up, Australia, historically wise, was difficult to approach, occupy and exploit. The distance and the circumstances the country found itself in gradually turned the image of Australia to somewhat irrelevant. And in turn, the leadership of Australia began to view themselves as irrelevant through the international geopolitical arena. This view of irrelevance has dominated past generations of Australians and even though that mindset is now changing, one invalid impression of the country still stands. Australia is a wealthy and prosperous country. In military terms, it may well be one of the most secure countries in the world. Yet, like most island nations, the geopolitical conditions of Australia make it a country whose sovereignty is subject to outside forces. Thank you for watching this Caspian Report which was brought to you by contributors on Patreon and if you want to support the show please go to patreon.com slash Caspian Report. For now, thank you for watching, take care and sahol.